So this was already a lot of food for thought. And I think what we can do is maybe dig a little deeper on some of the very important points that Sabrina has made. And I would like to do that with the five panelists that you can now see up here. And I will start with uh, uh, the introduction with uh, Emma Fuchs who's um, an activist with Fridays for Future. She's a student here in Berlin at um, the Lilienthal Gymnasium. Um, and she's really busy, so we're glad to have her here tonight. To my left is um, Sven Giegold, who is a member of the German Green Party, co-founder of uh, Attack in Germany, uh, and a member of the European Parliament. To the very right is Andreas Kremer. He's uh, the director of the Oceano Azul Foundation, which is a Portuguese foundation that uh, is dedicated to the preservation of the ocean. And uh, he's also the founder and director and will forever be involved, he said, in the um, Ecological Institute in Berlin, a private nonprofit think tank that provides expertise to the public sector, um, of course, with the focus on uh, ecological transformation. To his left is Ophelia Omnes. Uh, you may have seen her around. Uh, she's been around here all day. She's a Presidium member of uh, JEF, which is the Young European Federalists in English, a youth organization that advocates European integration and democratization. And she's a lawyer too, and has just returned to Paris from a job in Luxembourg. And to the very left is Ria Schröder. She has been the um, president of the Young Liberals in Germany since 2018. <laughs> Which leaves just me, and uh, I'm not Darth Vader without the armor. I'm just a journalist with a cold. <laughs> and my name is Anna Sobra. I work for the Tagesspiegel. So we've got about an hour until we get to your questions. Um, and I think I've got four points on my list that I would like to discuss. So this forces all of you to be very brief and concise. Um, and I would like to start with what Sabrina has already addressed, with what are the right instruments? Um, shall we use market type instruments? Or shall we invest in more innovative products? Or do we need good old-fashioned regulations, just do away with all the stuff that's bad for the climate? And um, I would like to uh, maybe start with you, Andreas, and since I assume you will probably say, well, we need all three of them and we need to balance them out in the right way, I would um, ask you to um, tell me what your priority is right now, since we know time is pressing. You know me. <clears throat> You know me too well. Um, yes, indeed, we need everything. We, we need it in the right combinations. But I will start with something very simple but very different that hasn't been said today. I'm an engineer. I'm a German engineer. I've been trained in constructive thinking. I use that as an introduction to tell all others that perhaps they need to understand the technical logic, the factual logic um, of solutions and of problems. I've come to the conclusion since I studied that the world has all the technologies it needs in order to solve the problems we have and in order to avoid the problems that we have. We, can, we have the technologies to stop doing the damage that we're doing. We have those technologies, but we have a habit of choosing the wrong ones. And it's important to understand why that is. Perverse subsidies is one of them. As long as there are subsidies that stimulate behavior, behavior that is damaging to social cohesion or to the environment, as long as we have those perverse subsidies, markets cannot deliver. So markets are very good at certain things, but they can only work if they're not distorted. And at the moment, what we have is massively distorted markets. They discount the effects on future generations, which is why Fridays for Future is such a great slogan, because it brings to everybody's attention that we need to think about that. So we need markets, we need regulation, and we need planning. The just transition that Sabrina has spelled out is really an exercise of intergenerational planning of a transformation in a certain direction. Planning is the third characteristic we need. Yeah, but I suppose just doing away with the wrong regulation or the wrong subsidies won't be enough. So could you name like one or two examples for policies that you'd like? 
that do not work. No, that work, they work. The, 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 I, I think that in Germany the energy transformation has worked very well during the phases where the government allowed it to happen uh, for the last decade. However, it has been slowed down. Um, I think that uh, we do see the innovation going into the electric mobility. Um, now, even if you buy a Tesla Model S, which is a very expensive car, the total cost of ownership over its lifetime is lower than of an equivalent Audi, BMW or Mercedes. Every German will understand that. Total cost of ownership over the lifetime is something completely different than the sticker price if you want to buy that car. But it tells you something about human nature and decision making. We discount the future lower cost of running the car to buying it. I'm telling you this because this is something where we, the technology works, but the market introduction has been held back by perverse incentives in the leasing systems and in the habits in which we finance the purchases of car and we think about the, pur uh, the purchasing of cars. Having used that example, I do not want to be going down here in your memory as a defender of um, individual mobility. I think that um, in addition in the transport transformation we need a massive shift towards mass transit and it needs to be good, efficient, safe, uh, reliable and all of that. Hopefully at Jeff uh, you do help um, write policy papers uh, trying to make politicians take the right decisions. So what types of um, regulation do you propose? Um. It would be difficult for me to give you like a specific policy in terms of, um, in t well, we have po uh, policies, but to target politicians, so, but it's more global, like we're all um, above party lines organization, so we won't get into like, um, you should ha be having this specific policies. The idea is really like, you should have a policy that takes into account the overall change, having in mind that there is this um, ecologi ecological transition, but it's not the only one, as it was uh, mentioned by uh, Sabrina in her keynote speech. There are a lot of things that need to be tackled all together, and then what we are really um, tackling is you need the structural change. And uh, funnily enough, we've been um, discussing and, and promoting this idea over the past few decades, actually. Um, and it's quite interesting for us to see that now there's uh, this um, ecological and, and technical um, pressure um, that everybody feels, then um, the thing that sounded like quite foolish or quite radical uh, a couple of decades ago when we asked for the structural change is not very much needed. Um, and what I would, I would say is really like, you need to focus on where um, measures are effective. And that's, and that's actually um, the, the point um, these days because it really feels like you will tackle ecological or, or, or digitalization um, challenges but like no, nobody really knows how and what kind of policy and really feels like it will fall from the sky like um, the state will tell you it's not um, our job to do and then and then the cities are trying to do their best, but they don't really know when they are very much um, relying on the state. And then, and then the European Union will tell you that um, it's the member state who have to do something. So eventually, like, there is a confusion in the system of who is supposed to do what. And what we've been um, advocating very much for is you need to um, do things where, where it makes more sense. So on the local level, you should have some initiatives because uh, it might make more sense for um, two cities like Strasbourg and Stuttgart to um, sit at the table and try to understand what kind of uh, mobility plans you might want to be doing for the region. Um, but when it comes to um, structural change on, on the state level, but even on the European level, and then we'll, we'll talk about that later on, I guess, um, you need to give that one level deciding the power to achieve things. So I think that's very much what, what we um, advocate for. We need to have this global perspective, but applied uh, locally differently to whichever level is, is, is the most relevant one, let's say. Thank you, Emma. Um, so one of the points that's really important to Fridays for Future is phasing out coal uh, quicker than um, it's supposed to, um, to phase out. So this would be like a classical regulation thing. Just set a point in time and tell everybody to just stop it. Why is that this important? And is that any in any way discussed or contested within the movement? Yeah, as, as you can see, um, there are some points that the market can regulate by itself. So governments have to um, 
say that coal has to end by uh, 2030. That's needed to uh, stop our greenhouse emissions at a time where we can still change anything because when we stop coal in 2088, I think, it's just too late. So the governments need to regulate uh, stuff like that and also like a price for greenhouse gases is needed. Now we have uh, 10 euros per ton, I think, in two years it should start, but uh, the science says it's needed uh, to, I think, 180 euros per ton are needed to regulate greenhouse gases and those, this money is something we have to pay now because if it's not paid now, my generation and all the generations of the future would have to pay it and that's not fair. And that's a point where governments have to take action. Governments taking action. Um, so wh what we see right now, mostly in Germany and, and Europe, is market-type instruments with um, emissions trading system, um, pricing. Um, at the same time, you could argue that maybe a completely different economy would be needed. So how content are you with what we see right now? So uh, <coughs> I, I find... 15 minutes, five people, and the big question, which instruments for the whole area of climate protection? And then you expect uh, something substantial rather than generality. So that is really difficult. And I, you I could work like with say, examples. But I mean, first, it's always good to have exactly, like a good but, um, uh, theory practice example. based on uh, examples uh, is also difficult. But the point is, um, what, what, concerning the economic system, I think we have no time to lose if we wait until some on the radical flank uh, of the climate movement say, we first have to overcome capitalism until we can save the planet. That is probably uh, the safe uh, death uh, of that generation. So uh, therefore we will have to use the forces inside of the market economy in order to get out of this. And then in order to have the democratic freedom to still make theoretical seminars about capitalism. So, uh, therefore, uh, I think it is absolutely needed. And, and, and the market economy it provides a, a good basis for rapid change. We have seen so often rapid change in market economies, but only if the incentives are right. And that is why it's, I would not agree with you to say that most of the instruments were market-based. No, they were not. Most climate measures so far were regulatory in nature, and there's nothing wrong with this. But what we don't have is a real price on carbon for the whole economy to steer innovation in the right direction. But what I, will, what I do not agree is the position of your um, leader of the party, not your youth organization, obviously, to play, to say, well, there's a contradiction between regulation and innovation and market forces. This is not a contradiction, but the right regulation is providing the framework in order for competition to develop the most efficient and best solutions. And therefore, we need climate regulation in order to use the forces of capitalism. And for this, CO2 needs a price, and we should stop with wrong oppositions in that debate and rather see clearly that we are really at a situation of urgency where we cannot afford anymore that the better is the adversary of the good. We will have to ride the tiger with all the available means. Yeah, do you agree uh, with, rather with uh, Christian Lindner or rather with um, what Sven yeah. just said? <laughs> If I understood uh, Sven right, then there is probably not such a big opposition and that we should focus more on what we have in common. And um, so there, I, I do uh, surprisingly uh, agree with uh, Sven um, because I think that that's exactly how it is. Um, the market has 
not a value itself if it doesn't work and if it is not competitive and if it doesn't lead to um, positive uh, results and if it doesn't uh, lead to a better life for people. So what we need is a regulatory framework, as you said, and uh, one that works actually and that is effective and that uh, brings us um, to a carbon-free future. And so what, what I would suppose is, and we, you've talked about the emission trading system already, that we, we use those market um, um, uh, functions, instruments. Um, but what we need before that is a strict limit to CO2 because we have no time as it was mentioned, um, to wait until uh, things stop and if, um, until we find a way to fly um, carbon-free, as we discussed earlier. Um, so we have to, um, what, what states can do is say, let's take a limit. We know how much CO2 uh, we can emit in the, in the next years and let's leave the price to the market. Because it, you said that, um, 10 euros, what is that? That doesn't change any behavior at all. And there will, we will need some behavioral change. Um, individuals, individuals have to change, um, companies have to change, and the state has to change. But how can we, um, can we achieve that? Um, I think the best way is, um, besides um, what um, also Sabrina was talking about, education infrastructure, which also has to come from the state, but that is a strict limit to CO2, which cannot um, be gone further, and that helps uh, to give the framework for innovation to happen. So if any of you want to jump in at any point, of course, you're free to do that. Oh, yeah. I think we have an agreement that we need markets with the right uh, regulatory framework. If there's a market failure, there is a policy failure behind it. But I think I want to highlight um, just one short example. Um, some 20, 25 years ago, there was a shortage of water in the city of Frankfurt. So they increased the price of drinking water by 15%. The water consumption did not go down one bit. The economists couldn't explain it. And then what the city of Frankfurt did is they put a poster up and they said, water is valuable, and they showed the picture of a little frog or another water-based animal. And suddenly, water consumption went down by 20%. Again, the economists couldn't explain it. <laughs> I'm saying this because we, all our policies fall into the trap of believing that economic theory actually is a good guide for what happens in real life, and it isn't. <laughs> I wish they were true that all the WWF posters of cute animals in town would really help preserve the rainforest. <laughs> um, I, I want to stick with you for a moment. Um, and uh, what we've heard is, of course, um, and, and sort of go to the next topic, and, and uh, Sabrina has addressed that too, um, is how do we tackle the transformation in a just way? And you've said, I guess uh, everybody on the panel agrees that we need a price uh, on carbon and that it needs to be higher than what uh, the German administration has just suggested. But um, how can it be a price that everybody can, be, can afford or what adjustments have to be made from a social perspective to that price? I think the measures have, to, have been discussed already. But the starting point, I think, we need to understand that the present economic system is deeply unjust. It is unjust to future generations and it's unjust to the poor. The poor in our own society within Germany and other industrialized societies, but all the more for the poor in other countries, in poorer countries. And this just transition implies that the people who hold the unionized well-paid jobs at the moment, that somehow their loss is worth more than the injustice that they are imposing on others already. So I think we need to be honest first about what is just and what is unjust, and I think it is important to do that and to say, with all respect to what you've achieved in your life, what you've built up, that you've powered the country uh, with your coal, if you've uh, provided mobility for society, if you're working in f on internal combustion engines, but these are technologies that are now doing way more harm than they produce benefit. In some cases, the total um, uh, damage done, soybean production in Latin America to conversion into meat in Europe, the whole value chain produces so many benefits, it's actually more than the turnover of that sector. 
The whole sector is parasitic. And as long as we don't honor, are not honest about um, those figures, I think we find it hard to convince people that they have to give up something. You can't tell people that they're doing great and that they're doing valuable things and then in the next moment tell them that they should do stop doing that. It doesn't work that way. You have to delegitimize the activities that are so damaging to the environment and to, to our social cohesion first. And after that, yes, you do have to help the vulnerable. Yes, to help people in transitions. You have to help with retraining, perhaps with relocation, and in some cases, you may need to allow people to continue with their activity until they retire, but not beyond, please. Yes, it's, it's one thing to explain to people that what you do is just, um, but it, of course, doesn't help when you have like thousands um, or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in the streets, uh, as Emmanuel Macron had in France. And um, this is now the, the go-to example, um, and Sabrina has pointed that out too, for uh, policymakers everywhere in Europe to say we can't do anything. It's the major excuse, um, the, the Yellow Vest movement in France. So, um, obviously, coming from France and now living again in Paris, what went wrong? And do you think the country will ever return to an attempt of introducing an uh, eco-tax? What went wrong? So many things, actually. There were so many problems with the introduction of this measure. Um, I think it's very much about the approach, like mainly if I have to um, be brief and concise. I think it's very much the approach on, on how the measure was introduced. Um, and I think generally, it is not a lesson for the rest of Europe that whenever you introduce um, an ecological measure, it will go wrong and you will have uh, millions of people in the street and all your Saturdays um, having your entire capital locked up. It does tell that you need to take people on board. And that's the case with ecological issues, but that's the case with everything. Like We, we could be discussing um, every other issue. When it comes to people everyday life, you cannot just decide wherever you're sitting, whether that's the Elysee or somewhere else, that this, uh, these are the sacrifices that you will have to make. And yeah, we're well, sorry, but if we want to change and save the climate, like, you will have to pay for it. I think um, if, you, if, you, if you listen to what people have to say, and then, I mean, on, on the other side, um, there are a lot of things that are not okay with what, how the uh, Yellow Vest movement went. Um, but I think that mainly, um, the concern is about how do you talk to people and how do you actually co-construct the policy with them. First phase is, okay, I need to understand where you come from. I need to understand what are the challenges. And this is actually what was the initial, um, um, well, the initial um, protest. And then it went wrong. But the initial protest was like, you are asking me to pay more tax on something that I absolutely need to go to work to maintain the very small level of, um, of, of standard, living standard that I have. And I think that's the problem. So first, you need to talk to people to understand where they're coming from. Then you need to construct your policies together with them. And then eventually, you'll end up seeing that they're um, a lot more um, acceptive of what you are trying to make them understand. And actually, and we are sort of seeing that a little bit with, with food. It's like, when you try to understand and try to slowly um, immerse some change, something that is a transition and not from this date on, you will have to pay, I don't know, the double uh, of price. Is that I, um, policymaker, understand that you, citizens, um, also have a living standard that you're trying to maintain. And I think putting uh, like themselves or ourselves as poli like policymakers into everyday life citizen shoes is actually what is going to help us take them on board to um, make them accept the radical change that we need in, in economy and society. So what would have been a, an alternate model? what is actually happening in France at the moment, being like, it's very nice to have a climate convention, but it would have been even nicer to have it beforehand. So I think um, it's a good tool that is being used, but rather too late. Like, it would have been better to do the opposite and do this convention beforehand and be like, I'm trying to understand the challenges in order to um, make some, some new policies. 
we'll get to the convention later on. Um, Emma, I'll come to you. Uh, I'll come back to you. But I want to um, go to Germany and look at the compensation mechanisms that are in the climate package that we have right now on the table, um, which is like uh, uh, an increased pendler pauschale, so um, a compensation for people who have long ways to go to work, for example, which was one of the major problems in France and other measures. What, what do you think about those? Will that be enough to um, make people accept what's on the table? Yeah. So um, the, the, the problem with this compensation mechanism, it means that um, for commuters until 2024, there's no net effect. But however, um, that is not the key of the, the, the core point of the debate. The core point is that the CO2 price is so low that it doesn't have any effect. And, uh, and therefore, uh, there's now a compensation mechanism for something which will have no effect. So that is not uh, uh, the, the real debate. The real debate is, uh, if we increase the price to a level that it has an effect, starting with 40 euros a ton and then increasing further, uh, then, of course, people will feel that another space of life is financialized. The atmosphere, which is so far free to use, free to pollute, is then financialized. This means another aspect of life, how much you have to care for the climate, will be distributed in a way that those who have little money will, have, will be forced by market forces to protect the climate, and those who are wealthy enough, they can buy out of it and still continue driving their third Tesla in the family. And, uh, and that is why we, why we have to be very careful putting all eggs into the basket of financialization. So I believe two things are necessary. First, if we financialize uh, the, to care about the climate, we have to make sure that inequality after the measure is smaller than before. This means the money we get, we get out of climate taxation or the auctioning of certificates has to be redistributed to the people per capita so that poorer people after the measure are better off than before. And second, it is not enough only to use uh, market-based or financialized instruments. We have to make sure by regulation that also the cars of the wealthy get smaller, that, it, uh, uh, that the means uh, to insulate buildings is also true for those who can afford to, uh, to endless heating, that we have regulation over products which make sure that the products everybody is using are the highest efficiency standards. So, Regulation is not the opposition of financial instruments or market-based instruments, but they, uh, the financialization of climate protection is only acceptable if we make sure that everybody, rich or poor, has to do their part to change their life. Otherwise, we will not get the democratic support. But everything is based on democratic support. And there, therefore, everyone, poor and rich, have to make uh, their part of adaptation. And after the reforms, the poor have to be better off than before. And this is why we want to redistribute by capita what we get from climate uh, financing and climate taxation. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and how, how do you make sure then that the instrument works? If I have just uh, the same money in my pocket as before, why, uh, why shouldn't I just spend it on the fuel um, and still take my car to work? Um, well, uh, because um, even if economists, as we learned by an economist, are always wrong, uh, uh, is uh, in, uh, one of the few true uh, um, sentences uh, of economics is incentives matter. So even if you have the same money in your pocket, you still will have um, a tendency to um, to consume less polluting things rather than more polluting things. And, uh, and this is, of course, uh, still working because the incentives change. So things are mean products become viable, which are not viable today, and uh, climate-unfriendly production models become unviable. And in order to get more speed into that change, and a clever mixture with regulation is needed and also with innovation policies. Mm -hmm. 
Ria, what, what do you think? And I'd like to uh, hear your thoughts also on the uh, suggestion of the energy geld, um, a compensation yeah. that is, um, suggested by the Greens. Yeah, um, maybe I put that first because I, I can't say much about it because my opinion is not ready with this. I find it very interesting and I find it um, a good instrument to um, secure social standards um, and not make it uh, question of, um, of social justice um, to, um, to save the climate, um, but I'm not ready with my opinion, so I can't say uh, much about that. Um, but uh, two points that I think we are missing out in the debate now is first that we also have to talk about responsibility, personal responsibility, but also um, uh, in, in companies. Um, and that we sometimes, I have the feeling, um, are losing that um, very important factor, I think. Because everyone has the, the possibility not only to look after his money and what is possible, but also um, going from Cologne to Berlin, I will take the train no matter what. I know that the flight is much cheaper and it's faster and I hate it, but I will take the train. And that's a personal principle and that is a personal responsibility that is about um, what do I uh, consume and that is a decision that I can make myself and that I would love um, in the debate uh, that we tackle that a little more and ask people um, what is what they can what they can do. I don't think that we should all be vegans not taking the car anymore by tomorrow, but uh, if everyone thinks a little bit of uh, about uh, what he or she can do in their everyday life, that would make us more conscious in the way that we live, and that is um, something that is very important. Also, um, to make instruments by the government and by companies more um, um, tolerated uh, more acceptable for, for the people. That is the one point. And the other is, um, I think we should not only talk about consumers. Um, because, yes, consumers, they will make decisions on what is more expensive and what not. But we should also focus on the companies. Because um, that is the place where innovation can take place. And if uh, we have uh, a price that is not only on the consumer level, but that uh, companies have to pay if they emit um, carbon, then um, they will think about products that are less um, bad for the climate. And they will have the innovations. We have to invest in, um, in, the, um, in the research and in uh, development to um, enforce um, companies to have products that are better. And then it will be easier also for consumers that have not a lot of money to decide for products that are um, better for the climate. Yeah, but what's the incentive um, to take the train if it, to Cologne if it really takes me like seven hours and I know I will be late for work, I won't be able to get back the same day, I just have an hour's appointment there. So what's, why should I do that? That's responsibility. <laughs> I would say, <laughs> because like, of course, nowadays it's it, we only have that, and that is something that everyone has to ask themselves. There is no incentive. There's none. It's a decision, uh, because I take my responsibility for not only myself and being uh, at time for work, but also for my environment and for the future. Um, and um, so th I think that is the only way that we can go talking about it more. And that is, I think, the crucial part in. Um, how we should regulate um, uh, carbon, that, we, um, th that the perpetrators of carbon will be the ones who pay for it. I have to say, even if I see the, the uh, rather cold reaction, I have to say I agree with the substance, not only because I'm a Protestant, and I think that responsibility is very important, personal responsibility as well, uh, and because sometimes in that debate, we forget what we really talk about. We talk not about instruments. We talk about flying less, uh, driving smaller, efficient cars, or better, no cars at all, eating less animal products, uh, not wearing always uh, clothes which are totally new, uh, not changing. The, so we really talk about deep changes of behavior. And if we do not name it, because politicians often don't dare anymore to talk about anything which is seen as saying something how people should behave. 
then we taboo something which is, in reality, the core of the whole debate. We only talk about the instruments because we want, in the end, these changes in behavior. Of course, there's the leftist approach. We only talk about we have to force the producers. Yeah? So the companies are the evil, and uh, it's, it's tabooed that, in the end, it's also about people. But what I don't like is when this argument, you haven't said that, is used in order to distract attention from politics. So personal behavior change is needed. But in order to be efficient, preaching will not be enough. Praying is a good start in order to get society to change. But in the end, we need politics and the means of power and law. And uh, some people misuse personal responsibility and appealing to consumers to avoid government regulation and common action and policies. And th but the latter is what we need in order to make the massive change which we all want. I would like... I'd just like to comment on that because um, as much as I agree and I took the train from Paris to Munich even though it was a lot longer than to take the plane, um, there is um, a price issue and how much it costs that we have to take into account as well. And I think like the problem often and often why the eco ecological um, issue is, is badly perceived sometimes is that it really feels like Either you have the, the means to uh, do what it takes to change, uh, or you're a bad consumer or bad citizen because you're taking the, 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 the plane because it costs less than the train. And I think that one of the reasons why we actually need some more regulation is also to put some solidarity mechanism in place. Because if we don't have, have the um, solidarity mechanism, then it will always end up to I am buying these kind of products because they are cheaper even though they are bad for the environment. And it, it, it comes to food, it comes to other uh, kind of, of goods. Um, and I, yeah, just would, I'm not saying I, I, I disagree, I'm just saying like we often um, hear this um, um, argument of your own conscience should tell you that you have to do that, not having in mind that for a lot of people and a lot of citizens, it's about how much it costs rather than what I would like to do out of my own conscience. And I'd like to get you back in the debate. Um, Fridays for Futures often reproach with not considering this type of question enough. Um, what does it do to the economy? Um, what are the uh, societal consequences of a certain type of regulation? Is that something you discuss when you get together with your group? Um, do you discuss compensation mechanisms, for example? Um, yes, but we think that it's... Uh, that um, saving the climate is very important and it's also the economical issues, uh, as a, we focus on it sometimes, and we're also talking about it, but um, we think that it won't have very bad consequences on economy. Um, yeah, and I think we have to change the system a lot. For example, um, the governments give 4.5 billions uh, euros every year to coal. And with that money, you could do so many other very good things. Um, also for consumers. Um, I know that taking the train is uh, often very, very, very um, expensive. And many people can't take the train because they just have don't have the money. So we need to change the system. And this is something, something the governments have to do. Their companies also have to do uh, very much. Uh, for example, 70% uh, of the greenhouse emissions come from 100 companies. And also consumers have to change their behavior in their daily life. So. Every part has to do their things. And, but there's no climate justice without social justice, but there's also no social justice without climate justice. 
because we can't have social justice on a dead planet. Which, of course, uh, the, if, you're, if you're a person working uh, in, uh, in the coal mines in the Lausitz, um, you will probably not subscribe to. What? Yeah, I know um, that's a point we're also often discussing. Uh, I know, like, workplaces... Um, won't exist anymore in some years. Uh, in coal industry in Germany, there are 20,000 workplaces. And those people will lose their jobs. That's very, very sad. But um, when many of those workers will won't work anymore in some years because um, many of them are very old. <laughs> and um, in the sector of solar energy, um, there were 80,000 workplaces and the government just cut them off. So those places, are, those workplaces are, it's, uh, we can give those people other workplaces in the sector of renew renewable energy. It's uh, not an argument against climate uh, justice. I can see Andreas nodding. But, um. No, I wasn't nodding. Um, no, I think it is, it's, just, it's necessary to tell the truth here. Um, the people who are working in the lignite industry they are not going to lose their jobs because they are protected until they come to their natural retirement age. So nobody is going to lose their job. The regions are going to lose jobs and the trade unions are going to lose the headcount as the people working in the industry goes down. It's the trade unions that are defending the size of their workforce. But the people who have the jobs, they won't lose anything. On the contrary, they have a good education and they have better pensions than most of you will ever get. Uh, I'd like to move on a little bit. And Ophelia has already addressed um, the question of how can citizens participate in the transformation. And Emma, I would like to start with you again in this round. Um, Fridays for Future has the strategy of mounting the outside pressure. So you're out in the streets and now Extinction Rebellion is taking two blockages. Um, to put it a bit provocatively, one could say that you're not really participating in the politics, but you're chasing um, policy makers. Um, so what would need to happen for you to become part of the inside process, to really, um, you personally, uh, be a member of a party uh, involved in, in the uh, more tedious um, undertaking of uh, writing laws and bringing them through the Bundestag? Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. Um, maybe someday I will uh, sit in the Bundestag or something like that. I don't know. It's possible. Um, but now... I, I'm just 15 years old. I can't even take part of elections, so I'm striking and putting the governments under pressure because I can't do anything else. I want to. Uh, I want my voice to be heard, and I think participating for Fridays for Future is the most effective way to do that. And many other people in my age also think so because. We can't do anything, anything else. We want our voice to be heard, and it works. It works very good. Ooh. Yeah, you probably know uh, what I'm going to say next. Uh, I'm going to cite uh, Christian Lindner, who said uh, that climate politics... <laughs> it's so old. ...was left to the professionals, oh and... Uh, and um, you have called him out on that. Um, yeah. Why? Actually, um, Christian Lindner and Luisa Neubauer did a podcast together and they were discussing about exactly that um, quota and actually they agreed because what he said was 
let's leave the technologies to those engineers and people that work um, with the technologies and let's not say, okay, um, e-mobility, for example, is the great big thing because maybe it's not a car in the future. Maybe it's um, power to X, maybe it's something else. I don't know, I'm not an engineer, um, but I know that um, also the batteries of uh, e-cars um, are not maybe the best thing uh, to focus on um, in uh, terms of um, also the climate, but also uh, human rights um, in uh, the, the countries where um, lithium and cobalt come from, for example. So let's leave that questions uh, to those who know something about it. And I think that's, that's true, even though I found the way that he proposed that um, not the best way, because what I think is crucial is that when young people especially, and I'm as a leader of a youth uh, organization. I know that I have members that are 14, 15, 16, 26 uh, years old and they fight for their future, they fight for what is important to them. Um, so of course I sympathize with other young people that go for what um, they think is important to go on the streets. And I find that uh, really great and I have great respect and I wanted to Christian, uh, Christian Lindner to have a little more respect for young people as well. So. Uh, <laughs> So let me, let me say one more thing because um, Emma just said that there's no other way and I, I don't want to make this a joke because I'm fighting for, uh, for example, the um, uh, possibility for young people to vote at the age of 16 at least and some th uh, things like that and I see that you feel you have no other options but going to a political youth organization, for example, going to a party <laughs> and it is, this is not a joke, it's a possible way to get involved in politics and make your voices heard also, it's not, I'm not saying stop going to the streets, but it's a good way um, to go into the debates, to go to the, um, to the parties, uh, to the congresses, and make your voices heard. I'm not saying go come to FDP, of course I'm saying that, but you can all <laughs> so go um, to all the other democratic parties, and that is a way where young people should get more involved, because parties do re really do need an update, and young people are the best ones to, to ask for that. Sven Giegold, I think the uh, average Green Party member is now over 62. Um, no? What's, what's the average age? Then it's late 50s. According to what I know is uh, uh, something like 47 or something, no. but it's not 60. No, no, no. no, no. You can, uh, you, we, we, check, we do a fact yeah. check right. okay. and, you, <laughs> and you, publish it, uh, you publish it on the Tagesspiegel website and we see who was near, right. closer by okay. the truth. We will do that. Okay? Uh, but anyway. Is um, that a good test? That's a good test. Okay. I, yeah. I agree. Um, but still, um, your party too needs new members as every party uh, in Germany. So, so how can political parties open up? So what Ria... Um, set should happen happens really that more young people do not um, only take to the streets but get involved in political parties because that's still uh, the way politics usually works in Germany is through political parties. Well, I, I, I think we, um, as a politician, I should really be humble because uh, um, in the last year we have uh, learned that it was not uh, the Green Party which changed uh, uh, the, uh, the politics in a way that uh, the green wave was made, it was you who triggered with your movement a huge uh, change, not only in Germany, but in many countries of the world in climate politics. Uh, we, the two of us, we have been arguing for climate protection for the last 30 years with little success. So therefore, I, would, I think it would be the wrong recommendation now as a politician to say all join political parties, that's the best you can do for the climate because you have proven us wrong. So uh, therefore, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, uh, but, I agree yes, but, now, but I, I agree that this is a wrong dualism. So you need people in the institutions which, who are at the right side, at the right moment, at the right place when the door is closed, when you are alone with the lobbyists and you still have to fight the fight. And, uh, and you need people outside who uh, make the pressure. But what, as, a, as I'm a member who create pressure so that politics is driven in the right direction. And that can only work 
when we de talk about deep transformation, when this is not top down, but, by, but uh, a strong movement wanted uh, by citizens as well as progressive companies, progressive trade unionists. So you need uh, all, all people to act in the same direction. But uh, the point is, the point against those who don't want to see the change. But as a, as a political party, I think there's one key thing what we can do in order to, so that pe the right people move into positions of power. And that is opening up positions of power for those who have made experiences as progressive entrepreneurs, as people who took responsibility in citizens' movements, uh, and so on. And that is an everyday fight. I myself came from NGOs, and I got a call from the Green Party, do you want to run for parliament? And I can only say one thing. I think as Greens, our responsibility is in the next years to ma make many calls to people in your movement and to tell you, now uh, you, it's the time for you to take over. You have to get positions of power so that with the power in the institutions, you can continue your fight you started and triggered in the streets. So our responsibility is to share with this new generation of of environmentally oriented young people to, to open up the corridors of power. That's the rule of the Green Party today, so it should be you to be the next generation in the parliaments. That's an invitation. <laughs> he'll, he'll vote for you. Uh, uh, you. You'll get a good place on the list. Um, Aurélie, you've already mentioned uh, Macron's attempt to involve citizens more uh, in the process, and that's something that's at least sometimes discussed here in Germany too, though with the Coal Commission, we see that interest groups and NGOs were involved, but not like random uh, citizens. And now Macross has a, a citizen a panel to advise on climate change, 150 uh, French citizens chosen at random. Um, can you tell us a little more about what it does and what it's supposed to do and whether you think it will work? Okay, before I do that, I'd like to mention that uh, between the streets and the political parties, that there are an entire range of NGOs and the entire civil society organization in which uh, Jeff stands very proudly. So in, there is something to be done in, between the streets and, and the political uh, parties, and I think it's very important to highlight that because we're actually the bridge between um, people being af active on, on, on the field and political parties, so I just wanted to mention that uh, beforehand um, about your question um, so one may or may not like um, Emmanuel Macron's politics in France to begin with so on w and one, one thing that you um, have to acknowledge um, in any case is that there have been many attempts uh, in the last two years from um, the French government to sort of involve the citizens um, there have been the um, consultation, um, the citizen consultation in Europe. Um, then there have been the entire crisis of the Gilets Jaunes, and then there was um, the reaction that was the, uh, called the Grand Débat, so like the big debate. Um, and then there is this one. And really, I think all the tools have been used. Um, first, uh, first of all, it was um, like the consultation was very much about meeting people and discussing. Um, Europe's future together with, with some people and then when um, like the uh, yellow vest um, crisis it became big there was this reaction of okay we need something online because like, online tools always works right like if you want to um, address so many people that you want to make them understand you heard what they're saying let's put an online tool and then you also had some meetings and so I think it was really like we tried everything um, and now is uh, there is an attempt for another way of, um, of uh, having citizen participation. So this one is, okay, so meeting people, it doesn't work, like uh, people say that they're not um, involved enough. The online tool is still didn't work enough to be widespread, so we're going to use um, randomly chosen citizens. So that's how it's going to work um, on, on the climate issues, is that there was this assembly that uh, would choose uh, 150 people, as you said, randomly um, to make sure that you have the um, vast majority of the population that is represented. And they're going to meet um, and discuss what should be the priorities of the French government um, in, when, when it comes to climate. Um, 
And is there a promise that the government will act on that or any sort of... Um so that's the point. There is never the, pro the promise that the, the, the government will act on that. Not in the sense that it won't act. Um, there is always this very um, broad sentence that um, the government and the president will listen to what the people have to say and decide accordingly. Then the problem is right there. What is decide accordingly? Like, are you, do you think it's mandatory? Do you think it, it's only consultation? It obviously is only consultation. And I think that's the main problem with all the attempts. I think um, trying is, is a great idea because France is a very centralized country, very top-down approach with everything, really. Um, everything is based in Paris, and in Paris, everything is in the ministries. And, and, and for the past couple of years, everything is in the Elysee. So it's really like good that um, someone is trying out a new way the only problem um, that uh, people feel, and, and I, um, like, I fear that um, this one won't work either, is that um, Emmanuel Macron is lacking the trust. Like People don't believe anymore that this is going to have an impact. And the problem is that having so many uh, attempts is good, but when eventually you have so many examples that the government does whatever it wants to do with the outcome, then it doesn't really push people to participate more. So we're slowly but surely running out of time, but uh, I'd maybe do a very quick round uh, on um, your thoughts of Europe, because that was um, <laughs> the, uh, that's the last item left on my list, and I do want to get uh, through my list. Um, Andreas, uh, in, the, in the current climate, and you've, I believe you've worked with uh, the European Commission, um, is there, uh, do, do you see a leap forward uh, nearing um, with Ursula von der Leyen being the new president and her at least ambitious approach to climate politics? Um, the Commission president doesn't make all the policies. Um, I don't think that one person is driving Europe forward or slowing Europe down. Um, this is much too big a project to be determined by just one person. Um, reading the reports on the various hearings of the commission ca commissioner candidates um, shows me that the European Parliament, and Sven, you can perhaps tell us more about that, is uh, the European Parliament is focusing in every single hearing on environmental issues, on climate issues. Um, so even the, the commissioner candidates for the other portfolios will have to answer for that. So they all are forced to understand and to say aloud in Parliament, in front of um, the people in the, in the committee that listens to them, um, what they think about it. And I think it was a great learning experience for quite a number of them. Um, so that is a sign of hope. But I think what is happening in Europe at the moment, climate is only one of so many um, uh, uh, dossiers that we have to deal with. And fundamentally, uh, Europe is under attack, physical attack, cyber attack, um, hybrid warfare attack, um, uh, social media attacks. It is amazing how the enemies of the European project, how, of the liberal order, of um, state institutions that make rules and enforce them, are homing in and try to weaken Europe in whatever way they can. Um, and we already see that the Europeans are responding to that. There are a number of mechanisms, the responses become much quicker, Part of that is in the, in the government machinery, part of that is in the media, part of that is in the thinking. People are beginning to understand that, this is, that there is a war going on over the future of Europe and there are those who want to destroy it and there are those who want to um, keep it but also improve it over time, help in its evolution. And that is what gives me hope. Um, when you look at um, the slow decline of populism, if you look at the effect of the Brexit debate on everybody else, suddenly we are rehearsing all the arguments about why Europe is an important project, and people are listening. Thank you. Let's maybe talk about uh, Ursula von der Leyen's proposal a little bit. Um, how do you see the chances for her to succeed, and what do you think about the different points she's made at the very beginning? So, um, look, the, I, I fully agree this is not simply the Commission proposing. So the Commission responded to the green wave in the European elections and the protests uh, which triggered again that green wave. So, uh, on the other hand, we have um, uh, now a German government which has not managed 
uh, to realize the current reduction objective until 2030 with minus 55%, because as was put rightly in the opening, where is she, here, that only as the measures uh, are not delivering the objective. So the objective is in the climate law, the measures are not. And the, it's a very similar situation in a whole number of member states. We are one of the worst in Europe, but we are not the only ones who are not delivering. So uh, what is Ursula von der Leyen now doing is, she's saying, increase the climate objective of 2030. But that, of course, can only work if the member states are ready to speed up. So uh, they have uh, basically what mean Macron has to stop doing consultation after consultation, but finally get laws voted. Uh, we have to do the same. We have to be much more radical in the approach. And only if we dare to do what is needed, Europe can credibly increase what is deeply needed, the climate objective. And then when we have the higher cl uh, climate objective, we need the right European tools in the different European laws. And that is what will now be put on the table, a European climate law. And then will be the big test for our um, a bit uh, tiring uh, Grand Coalition. Because if they then say no against uh, stepping up the European ambition, because they are not even ready to fulfill the much lower current uh, conditions, then the whole project is doomed to failure. And we have exactly one year, because next year is the Global Climate Conference. And for this Global Climate Conference, Europe must come with a, f with a credible um, plan how to fulfill the Paris Agreement. Otherwise, the Paris Agreement is globally dead. And therefore, the most important role of Europe is to be the region of the world which has been co-responsible creating the climate crisis as a wealthy part of the world to have a credible offer on the table. If we fail in the next year to deliver, Europe cannot uh, keep the Paris Agreement alive. And therefore, we have one year, and that year, we have to win that debate. Ophelia, one could of course ask whether the European Union is um, in its current institutional setup capable of uh, producing or making those policies work. I mean, there are sanctioning mechanisms. It's costly for states not to meet the goals, but they still rather pay than uh, um, uh, introduce policies in their own countries that would meet the goals. So what, what, what is Jeff proposing? Is the institutional setup um, ready to tackle climate change? That is the golden platter question, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I was about to say, one needs to be very careful when we say Europe needs to. And one criticism that um, I've heard from my German friends, so I feel entitled to say it in Germany, is that the German government needs to deliver eventually. And one of the reasons why um, it looks like the French president has been um, acting alone and um, very, very, being very vocal all alone is that he has been waiting for the German government for the past two years. And uh, one may get into the details, but um, if you look at um, EU politics, um, it's not even just the French waiting for the Germans to get into um, a, a more progressive approach on what Europe should do. It really looks like a Germany is um, holding back on what Europe is trying to, to do. And I was saying one needs to be very careful who Europe is and I'm um, answering your question uh, this way, is that Europe, at the moment, is mainly member states' administrations or member states' um, uh, decisions. Because, well, the, the Commission can be as bold as it wants if it doesn't go through the Council, um, and one of the reasons, in, in, in my personal opinion, why um, Ursula von der Leyen tried to show how bold she was is that because she came out of this closed, um, closed door deal that um, was discussed within the council to decide who would be the next um, president of the, of the commission. So this, this just show how powerful the council is, not only in its own corner of being the council, but also on how much power has, um, like have the other institution to push um, progress forward. Um, and so, yeah, eventually the, the very easy answer to that question is no. Like the current uh, framework um, is not designed um, to be efficient. 
uh, our model, like what we promote and what we've been promoting for the past 70 years now, um, is, is federalism. Uh, because as I was explaining earlier, not only does it give uh, well, local, national and European powers where it actually matters, um, and when we talk to a climate change fight and preserving or at least, at least reaching um, the levels that we agreed on in the Paris Agreement, then we need the European Union to be strong on that. Um, but in order to have a European Union that is strong on that, we also need a um, structural institutional change that stops having the Commission being held hostage of the member states. And I think once we understand that we need to shift the power, we need to have a commission that is a real European government that can actually propose things and that can actually then sanction member states um, for not behaving the way they should, then we can start talking about what kind of global actor we want to be, because I agree, it, 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 um, it is about climate, but it's also about so many other things that are also on the, on the global level. And if you, and I'll end up with that, if you ask the Europeans if they think um, if the European level is relevant, they do. Because um, if you look at the last uh, European elections, you have um, an increase of turnout because of, of the climate issues, but because of defense as well. And in the, in the last polls of, uh, of the Eurobarometer, Europeans do believe that it's important. And then in the European institution do believe they should be entitled to do something. And then in the, in the, in the middle, you have the member states that are like, whoa, 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 you are taking away some of our um, um, prerogatives. But I think it's high time for the member states to acknowledge that they don't have that power anymore. They don't have the power to change things on global level, and they have to acknowledge it, and they have to let go of that so-called power they still have, and give it to someone that can actually make a difference on the global stage. Thank you. We will now take uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes for your questions. And um, please introduce yourselves. Don't make it too long, and uh, say you're addressing it to Who's quickest? You are quickest. It's you. Is there a microphone in the room? I can just. Yes, there is. <laughs> Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm a, I'm a campaigner, facilitator, and at the moment, frequent tourist in the Extinction Rebellion camp. Um, so we have, the, we have the tech, right? We have the policy plans, we have the real price that should be on the carbon. We have even a young liberal saying we need a strict carbon budget. I'm surprised. Now the question it boils down to me is, um, and the, that's not news, right? That's what we have for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. The only news is that 15-year-old girl sitting here who changed the whole landscape of the debate and her 16-year-old friend who wins the Nobel Peace Prize tomorrow, hopefully, right? This is the news. And the change we're facing needs to be, the question comes in a second, needs to be super radical. We're in a race for life, bottom line, right? We have the permafrost coming early up. We have the Arctic melt. So I think we can't talk about incremental changes anymore. We need to talk about when this German government leaves the stage before 2021. My question is, do you agree? If it's a yes, tell me how. If it's an old tell me why, we should still wait for those guys. Thanks. Well, we don't have a representative of the German government um, on this stage, um, but let's maybe ask uh, Ria, I guess. Yeah, I love uh, talking about the government. Um, <laughs> well, I, th I think we have a problem with the government because what we, and I'm convinced by that, we don't have a problem with the democratic system itself, but we have a problem with the government who is not, um, not awake enough to uh, solve problems before it's too late. They always wait, and we have seen that in, like, in the last 13, 14 years, um, that every problem is seen and it's there and then it's waited and at some point a little step is made and then people say okay at least something happened it's like with the climate package that we have now um, so I agree that we don't have um, we don't have the time for that we don't have to we have to, don't have the time to wait for the government to like for Angela Merkel to leave because I think she's 
as though, even though I respect her, I think she's part of the big problem that we have and of the little steps that are being made. Um, and I think we need a new government and we need it soon because what we also see in the climate package is that decisions that might hurt a bit, they are put in the future. They happen in uh, 26 or something. Um, so I, I think that we will have a government for at least another year. Um, because we have the, the budget um, will be uh, passed um, in November, I think, and then we will have it for at least one more year. Let's see what the SPD is doing. Um, but I think it's not, we don't have to wait until 2021. That's my uh, guess. Um, but one more thing that I want to um, state is, yes, we need to do something. And there's a lot that needs to be done very quick. But we can discuss that here and maybe most of the people here will come to the same conclusions, but in a democracy we have to convince people and we cannot go the way to like put all the measures and be uh, climate um, neutral by tomorrow and lose all the people. And that is something I really want to put to the hearts that I'm convinced that we are able to convince people because we are talking about a big issue and it will affect everyone in this country and, uh, uh, um, and in internationally. Um, but we have to go that way and it's a hard way and we will, sorry, but we will not convince them by putting street blockades, um, but we will convince them by talking to them, by going to the people. Um, I, I know it's against the government and not against the people, but we have to talk to people if we want to convince them and to um, have our ideas um, made reality. All right. Thanks, you. Um, I think we'll take one more question because uh, people look hungry and actually some have deserted us and gone to the buffet and I want to make you get down there quickly so you get something too. Um, one more question. Yes. Yeah, hi. So um, my name is Grant, um, and if you can't tell by the accent, I'm an American. Um, so well, I think one of the things that we've talked about is, is transitioning, but one of the things that has uh, kind of also been underlined is that this is a, a global problem. Uh, Europe accounts for not a marginal amount of, of the global carbon emissions, um, but it's by far not the largest contributor to climate change. Well, number uh, three. Yeah. Number yeah, num number three behind China and the United States. So, uh, in terms of wanting to get a new government, I'm on the same page in my own country, um, but what does it look like if that doesn't happen in the United States when the world's second largest emitter isn't playing ball? Uh, Thank you. Andreas, would you like to answer that? Um, I think it is important to understand that industrial countries like Germany have not only historic responsibility, but they also have a current responsibility because they have technological competences. They can develop solutions, uh, technical solutions, business model solutions, networking solutions, in a way that most African countries, most Latin American countries, most Asian countries can't. So if we don't do it, if we don't turn the corner and reduce our emissions and restructure um, significant parts of our economy, we cannot expect others to do it. You asked what will happen if America doesn't play ball. Well, America does play ball. Um, if you don't listen to the rhetoric coming out of the White House and the Republican Party, but if you look at what is happening in the American states, in, in the various cities, what the businesses are doing, then the United States is actually faster in its energy transformation at the moment than the Germans are, because we have lost the speed in the last decade, and we should reflect on ways of picking up that speed again. Let's lift the ceiling on the building of wind turbines. Let's abolish the Eigenverbrauchsumlage, which is tax... It's like taxing somebody for eating apples out of their own garden. It is absurd, that, that levy. We have, should remove that. And, let me say one thing at the end. Europe is great because it is a po learning policy-making machine. Every single directive at the end has a clause that says within a number of years the member states shall write reports about the success or failure of implementing the directives and then the commission evaluates that and then the commission proposes, if necessary, and it's always necessary, changes to the legal framework. And then after five or eight years you can fix the laws. 
This is something that few other policy-making machines have. This is unique in Europe. So you can start a process knowing that it is imperfect because you know you will have a chance to improve it in the future. That's a great thing to have. Thank you very much. Great, great closing statement. Um, uh, just one last thing before I really leave you to, uh, to go have a beer um, is that the average age of uh, the Green Party is actually 49. It's not 47, but I was way off. Okay. Um, uh, you, you, you get a beer. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, all right, all right, all right. Um, I have corrected myself. Um, and, okay, all right, we'll discuss that over beer, I hope. No? Okay. But everybody else has beer now because uh, we'd like you to stick around, uh, have some food, have some drinks, and um, dance, and listen to the live music, and enjoy and discuss some more. Thank you very much all for being here.